Very good morning to all of you. Um, let us stand um, as we prepare to worship God in song. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to quickly read 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from the fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. Let's stand and sing nothing but the blood of Jesus. Why can't wash away my sin? Nothing but 
got the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But the blood of Jesus, all my praise for this I bring, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. great God that we have. He is indeed our rock um, and there's nobody else worthy of our worship. So let's continue singing.
Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Hope Church this morning. It's fantastic to have you join us here. My name is Cameron, uh, one of the pastors. And uh, look, if this is uh, one of your first times joining us, maybe you've come in to check out Jesus or check out church. Uh, so glad that you've been able to come and be a part of this this morning. We, we hope that and pray that you would be, I guess, pleasantly surprised by what you hear, what you see, what you can be a part of this morning. Because what we are all doing here is because of one man, and his name is Jesus Christ. He's the one that has brought us together, and he's the one that we've come to hear of and to sing praises to. Uh, you might uh, have heard people say over the years you know, that Jesus is perhaps uh, the most influential figure that has ever walked this earth. 2,000 years ago, he came, and for 2,000 years and more, that he will continue to be the greatest influencer in that kind of way. But have you considered, actually, that maybe he's also been the most controversial figure to have ever walked this earth? You know, we, we actually began our time this morning in a most controversial way. You realise that the things that we were singing were most controversial? You know, that we just sang of the one who, through no one else, can we be saved. Through his blood and through nobody else can we be right with God. That we can have a hope, we can have forgiveness, we can have life through nobody else but him. That's, that's a, what a crazy and outlandish claim for people to make about Jesus. Let me um, read you a couple of uh, verses from 1 Timothy chapter 2. It come up on the screen as well. This is what the Apostle Paul writes. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, a man. Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Friends, this is what uh, we've come to consider this morning. But these, uh, what we'll see is not just the very words of the Apostle Paul, though that is more than enough, but actually from Jesus himself. Uh, Our guest preacher for today, Philip Jensen, is joining us and we'll be opening up Mark chapter 2, where we'll see Jesus say these very uh, out there words and claims about who he is, as we keep asking this question in this series, who really is this Jesus? So with that in mind, will you join with me in prayer as we continue our time together, but also as we prepare ourselves to hear truly who Jesus is. So join with me now as we speak to our Father in heaven. Father, we thank you that you have gathered us here today and we've come from all sorts of different places, different days and weeks and mornings and yet there is one great message that you have for us and that is we can be saved and know life in Jesus Christ alone. Father, we pray that you might prepare us this morning to consider him, to consider his words and as we do so, merciful God, We humbly admit that we need your help in that. We we confess that we have wandered from you and your way, and we acknowledge that you alone can save us. So work in us this morning, Lord. Renew us through the preaching of your word, in the power of your spirit, and amongst the fellowship of your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My name's Casia. It's so great to see all of you this morning. Um, I'm one of our kids' leaders, and I'm bringing to us our kids' spot this morning. But I actually wanted to invite our kids to come to the front this week, and I'm going to invite our leaders up as well to the front, um, because this morning we are going to be singing a song together. So if you're a kid, if you're in primary, um, please come to the front. We're going to all sing together. And our leaders will be coming up as well, so you can follow them to the front. Yeah, you can just stand facing the stage for us. Awesome. (laughs) Awesome. Wow. Look at all of our kids. So great to see you all. Well... 
This morning, we are singing a song called Who's the King of the Jungle? And the reason, kids, you can, you can face me for now and maybe when we sing, we can face our parents. But the reason we're singing this song is because in Kids Church since uh, January, we have been going through the Gospel of Mark as well. And we've been learning all about Jesus, the King of God's kingdom. And so in this song, we're going to sing about how Jesus is the King of the jungle. He's the King of the sea. He's the King of the universe. And he's the King of you. And he's the King of me. And that's because Jesus is the King of God's kingdom. And God's kingdom is everywhere. So we're going to sing, but in a... But First, I'm going to teach us the actions real quick. Now, lots of you know it because we've done this song in kids' church. So we're going to go through them pretty quickly. Um, but then we're going to have a go at singing it. And Jimmy's going to play the guitar for us. We're going to have a bunch of fun. Okay, but kids, we're going to, I want you to repeat the words after me with the actions. I'm just going to speak them and then we'll sing them after. Parents, you can go along from the crowd as well if you'd like. So you can join us in doing the actions. Okay, so our first line is, who's the king of the jungle? Who, who? It's like a little gorilla or a monkey or something. Yes. Okay, ready? Who's the king of the jungle? Who, who? Awesome. And then we go, who's the king of the sea? Bubble, bubble, bubble. Yeah, awesome. And it's, who's the king of the universe? And who's the king of me? Oh, that's really great. You guys, you guys are picking this up so quickly. All right, and what are we going to say? We're going to say, I'll tell you, J-E-S-U-S, yes. Can we do that all together? Ready? I'll tell you. J-E-S-U-S, yes, he's the king of me, he's the king of the universe, the jungle and the sea. Awesome, that's great kids. All right, we're going to sing that all together. Our words are going to be up on the screen as well if you need to see them, but I want to see you doing your best dancing moves and we're going to sing. Now parents, if you want to stand up with us, can you stand up with us? We're all going to sing it together as well. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Are we ready? Hold there for a moment. We are about to go out into our programs. And so we're going to go out. Our kindergarten to year five will follow our leaders. Our youth kids are also going to go out. Um, and if you have a child that is not in school yet, we also have our creation preschool programs, which have begun. But feel free to take them over now if you haven't yet. Um, but K to five, can you follow your leaders out? And youth group as well, are you six to eight following leaders out the back? Thanks. Oh 
don't have a Bible on hand or on your phone, and please do stick up your hand, and we'd love to uh, bring one around to you so that you can be reading along. Keep that hand up. Our first uh, reading will be from Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3 in the, uh, the Old Testament. Beck, do you have a uh, page number there for Ecclesiastes 3? 608. 608. That sounds like we're doing bingo or something here or at um, the local RSL. 608, your order is ready. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Let me pray for us as we come to hear God's Word. Father, we thank you that you are a God who has spoken and you've revealed yourself to us, your very character, you have revealed your plan uh, and purposes for history. So Lord, as we come now to hear you speak as we open up, read, hear and inwardly digest your Word, Father, we pray that you might be Uh, helping us, shaping us, growing us and convicting us by what we hear and consider together, principally about who your son Jesus really is. In his name we pray, amen. Good morning everyone, the reading is Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 to 8. There is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to avoid embracing, a time to search and a time to count as lost a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. The next Bible reading is from Mark chapter 2. It's on page 920 in the Church Bibles. We're reading all of the chapter. When he entered Capernaum again after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many people gathered together that there was no more room, not even in the doorway, and he was, the, and he was speaking the message to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic carried by four men, Since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above where he was. And when they had broken through, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was lying. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. 
But some of the scribes were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right away, Jesus understood in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves and said to them, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your mat and walk? But so you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, pick up your mat and go home. Immediately he got up, picked up the mat and went out in front of everyone. As a result, they were all astounded and gave glory to God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Then Jesus went out again beside the sea The whole crowd was coming to him and he taught them. Then moving on, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he got up and followed him. While he was reclining at the table in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also guests with Jesus and his disciples because there were many who were following him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he told them, those who are well don't need a doctor, but the sick do need one. I didn't come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. People came and asked him, Why did John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, The wedding guests cannot fast while the groom is with them, can they? As long as they have the groom with them, they cannot fast. But the time will come when the groom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, Otherwise, the new patch pulls away from the old cloth and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost as well as the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. On the Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields and his disciples began to make their way, picking some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? He said to them, Have you never read what David and those who were with him did when he was in need and hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abithar, the high priest, and ate the sacred sacred bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests, and also gave some to his companions? Then he told them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. I'll keep the music going. I'm not there yet. (laughs) I think you've been going in numbers. You notice today's date? wonderful 2002 it's a great date isn't it okay Jesus uh, was and is the life of the party if you look in the inside here you see the outline of what I'm going to be saying over the next little while and I'll be covering each of those headings and we'll be looking at that passage so keep it over in front of you in fact, I'm going to sneak a little bit of last week and a little bit of next week in as well too because the, the paragraph right at the end of last week was about Jesus healing a leper, which I hope you remember. And the one that comes next in chapter 3, now he entered the synagogue again and a man was there who was, had a paralysed hand. In order to accuse him, they were watching him closely to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. He told the man with a paralysed hand, stand up before us. And then he said, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do what is good or to do what is evil, to save life or to kill? 
but they were silent. After looking around at them with anger and sorrow at the hardness of their hearts, he told the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and his hand was restored and immediately the Pharisees went out and started plotting with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Well, it's great to be here with you this morning and to see some old faces that I haven't seen for a long time, just getting a little older, and it's nice to see uh, some new people that I have not met before, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, who doesn't like a holiday? I mean, we've just had our holiday season, haven't we? But they were funny holidays, but we like holidays, don't we? I mean, how could you not like a holiday? But it might come as a surprise to you to discover that Actually, God loves a holiday. In fact, he created holidays. Don't know if you've ever thought about it or not, but he, he, when he created the world on the seventh day, he created the Sabbath. See, that's the heading I've got now, one A. He's on the Sabbath. That is the holiday day. It's every seven day, knock off work. Take, take a break. Every day, every week, there is a holiday. It's commanded in the Ten Commandments. It's the fourth commandment. In fact, there's lots of other bits of the law in the Old Testament about the Sabbath and how you're to rest, your crops, your animals, how everybody is to rest. It's not just a, a holiday for the bosses, the servants are to rest as well. Uh, everyone is to stop work and this weekly pattern of work and rest, work and rest, work and rest creates a separation between work and rest. That's really important to actually have that separation. We're losing it a lot at the moment, aren't we? When we're working at home or working with computers anywhere, everywhere, all the time. And it creates the work-life balance, which so many people in our time-poor society are struggling with. Our modern computer world and the destruction of weekends where we no longer can actually take time off together, is putting life out of kilter for a lot of working people and working families. But the scriptures, God created holidays. And Australians should love it because we were notoriously known as the land of the long weekends because we had more than almost anybody else. We love our holidays and our holiday times, but we're struggling now because of the destruction of the weekend we're struggling to time, take time off with each other together in our families. Doing nothing time. It's important that we're not going anywhere to do anything. We're just being with each other and enjoying life and God's good creation and God's good gift of life and family. Worse still, we Christians in previous years, in the 40s and 50s and so on, we tried to defend the weekend the wrong way by banning pleasure on the Sabbath. We turned you shall not work on Saturday into you shall not play on Sunday. And so gave the impression that really God doesn't like any holidays, doesn't like you to enjoy yourself. We gave out the message that God was a serious spoil sport against all pleasure and against all enjoyment. But when you look at Mark chapter 2 and you meet up with God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, you see that Jesus was the life of the party. So turn with me to the passage and, and look here for a moment. Or two. You're going to have to do some work, by the way. I'm going to ask you to talk to the people beside you, so I hope you really like them or know them vaguely anyway. And If you don't, get to know them. And then I'm going to get you to call out some answers for me too. So there's a bit of work we're just about to head to, right, on this passage. Because I think within this passage, there are people whom I'm calling the prisoners. You'll see there's a, 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 a lack of information on your outlines there, A, B, C, D. That's because you're filling it in, right? There are prisoners here, people who are in bondage. They're not free, but they're captives. Not locked up in prison, Long Bay Jail kind of prison, but locked up in the prison of their life at that time. And I, I could see six groups at least, at least there. And so I want you to talk to the person next to you and think through the passage that we've just had read to us, uh, who are the prisoners? Who are the people who are captives? Who are the people who are not free but actually under some kind of bondage in this passage?
Go for it. I'll give you just a few minutes to do that with the people with you. Okay, well, let's see who we can get as a large group. You see, there's an advantage in our sharing our, our uh, information together. Who can tell me any prisoner at all? Yes. The paralytic. The paralytic. He's a prisoner, isn't he? Yes. Because he's, he's tied up, isn't he? He can't go anywhere. He has to have his friends to carry him there. But it was even worse to be a paralytic in the time of uh, Jesus because actually you couldn't go to the temple if you're a crippled person. And so you're excluded from the community. In fact, everybody would see a paralytic and know that he had sinned because why was God treating him and judging him like this? And so he was alienated from friends, from family. He had these friends who carried him there. But you get this incredible story of the paralytic. Yes, who? The... Oh, the tax collector. Oh, yes, the tax collector. He was a real captive, a dreadful man. You see... To, to get tax collecting in, in those days, you, you really had to bribe the Roman government to give you the job because it was a very good job for making lots of money. And so what you did was you, you paid a huge amount of money to the Romans one year, then you collected masses of amount of money the next year, which uh, just paid the taxes. Then the third year, you paid all the money for yourself, and then the fourth year, you had to pay the, for the Romans again. But it was worse than that because they were collecting money from the Jews to give to the Romans who were oppressing the Jews. So here are the soldiers who are oppressing you and you're paying for them to oppress you through this tax collector who is Jewish. It's a, he's a traitor, absolute traitor, a corrupt, immoral, you can't do, it's pretty hard to work out how you can be worse than a tax collector. It really was the pits, yeah? I'm gonna walk, keep coming. The Pharisees, yes, they're, they're locked up in all their rules and regulations. And so, you know, they had so many rules and regulations, especially about the Sabbath. You know, you couldn't work on the Sabbath. Therefore, you couldn't look in the mirror. Now, why couldn't you look in the mirror? Because if you looked in the mirror, you may see a grey hair. Well, for some of us, yes, that's, that's the case, yeah. <laughs> but what's the problem with that? Ah, well, if you looked in the mirror and saw a grey hair you might be tempted to pull it out. And pulling it out would be work, and you're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. And so there's got all these massive rules and regulations as to what you can't do. And fasting, you know, that's what he picks on the disciples and fasting. Anyway, the Pharisees, yes? Who else have we got? This side has been very quiet. These masks are dreadful, aren't they? Next week's going to be good, isn't it? Anyway... Who did you say? The scribes, yes. The scribes were the people who actually worked for the Pharisees, teaching them the rules of the Pharisees had worked out. The scribes and the Pharisees worked together in this process of working out the rules and regulations for everybody, yes? Any others we've got here? Oh, yes. The fasters, yes. <laughs> They're denied food. You know nearly every religion denies people food? Ever thought about it, you see? 
The, the Muslims have their fast days. The Jews had their fast days. There's, the, the Hindus, are not, I can't eat this food and that food. If you eat pork on Friday night, right, you alienate everybody except the Chinese. The Chinese eat everything all the time. That's, that's the character. You can even eat the chook's foot with the, foot of the Chinese. But, but everybody seems to get alienated by... You don't feast, you fast. Feasting is holidays, is happy time, isn't it? Fasting is mourning, is sadness. Is... And the Pharisees, and not only the Pharisees, but John the Baptist's disciples, they were fasters, not feasters. They weren't party people, they were mourners. Yes, any others we see in captivity? I've got a very eager, well-educated one down here who's marvellous and I love your hand, but I'm going to ask some of the older people who aren't as clever as you. <laughs> Come. Yes? The, sorry? Women. The women. The women certainly are, but in this passage I'm not sure there were women. Were they mentioned? But the women are ever since the time of Genesis chapter 3. There is that being suppression. The sinners, yes. Who are the sinners? Well, they're all of us in one sense because we all are sinful. But they, there was a group that they saw as sinful that went with the tax collectors. So why is he eating with the tax collectors and the publicly notoriously immoral people, the sinners that they are speaking of? Yeah. So there's lots of them. What's your last one? The sick, you're not wrong. I'm glad. This, you are, what's your name? Phoenix. Phoenix. Phoenix has got it. The sick, you see, that man who was the leper, right? he had to go around. We understand it just at the moment. You know, when there's a pandemic, you've got to avoid people, haven't you? One of the pandemics of the ancient world was skin diseases. Once you got skin diseases, it was contagious. Therefore, we had to stay away from people. Leprosy was the classic one, but the word is, is, is not just includes lepers. It was anybody who had skin diseases. You had to stay away with every... And so what you did was you called out unclean, unclean. And of course, you were unclean. Your skin was unclean. And you couldn't meet with anybody else. People would leave food out for you, but you couldn't go and eat with anybody because you might make them unclean. And so... You were, you were locked out from society, from friends, from family, and you spent all your lifetime in the street saying, I'm unclean. That's a lovely way to live, isn't it? <laughs> COVID patient, COVID patient, COVID, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah exactly, that's it's what it was. The lepers of today, I always think... Uh, are the poor people who still smoke cigarettes and therefore at, you see them outside office blocks in little corners puffing and everybody is avoiding them. I'm sorry if you're a smoker. Uh, but I'm sorry for your health and I'm sorry for your money. Uh, it, it doesn't mean you're unspiritual, but you're treated as if you're a leper. You're treated like, you know, you've got a disease, you've got to be stuck away somewhere else. Please stay away from me. Now... All these people, you see, are captives. What, why have we got all these captives, these prisoners, these people in bondage in this chapter? Because it's all about Jesus bringing release. That's what it's about. It's the release that Jesus was bringing. In each one of them, Jesus frees them from their captivity, their, their alienation, their condemnation, their, their shame. And in each of these releases, it's surprising. There's a surprising element. I mean, the leper back in chapter 1, verse 20, 41, Jesus reached out and touched him. Nobody touched a leper. That's like kissing a COVID patient. You know, you just don't do that. But instead of Jesus getting his disease, he gets cleansed by Jesus. It flows the opposite direction to your expectation. Or... The man who's lowered down through the roof. Now, that was, that's a gathering you'd never forget, isn't it? You know, some people say, how can, how can they remember 30 years later what was taking place? 
Well, let me tell you, at my age, it's not really hard to remember 30 years earlier. That's simple. Yesterday, that's difficult to remember. But 30 years ago, hey, I got that down pat. Uh, what happened 30 years ago? 1992. Can anyone tell me anything happened in 1992? Your son was born. Do you remember? Yeah, there are certain things in life that are very memorable. And, and you do, you can't help but remember these great things. Uh, this shark attack this last week reminded me immediately of the shark attacks in Middle Harbour back in 19, whenever, 60 something, it was a lot longer than 30 years ago, where the young actress was taken, although she was actually only in water up to about her knees, her thighs, and she was taken by a shark. Not hard to remember that event. She'd been converted to the 59 Billy Graham Crusade, so it was about 1963, something like that she was taken. Well, 63 is a lot more than 30 years ago. It's nearly 60 years ago. But I remember it. Why? Well, it was such a shocking thing. <laughs> you don't remember everything, but the big thing, you remember the day when we were all there together and suddenly the roof opened up and then this bloke was lowered down on, on, a, on a mattress, kind of, on, a, on, a, on his bed. Do you think you would forget that day? No way in the world you'd forget that. I always think it's an interesting thing, you know. You've got four blokes lowering it down. If the two at the feet lower faster than the two at the head, <laughs> I mean, he's paralysed, so there's not much more he can do except for slide in midair. Is anyway, but <laughs> I was a child. I went to Sunday school. These stories filled my imagination. You remember certain things. But what's surprising is, when he gets there, Jesus says to him, be healed, go walk. No, he doesn't. He says to him, your sins are forgiven you. And you want to say, Jesus, check the legs. You know, he hasn't come for his sins, he's come for his legs. You, you, you know, you've missed the point. But there's something even more astonishing than that. And the scribes, the Pharisees, they saw it. Who does he think he is for giving people sins? You know, now Cameron does the wrong thing by me. I can say, Cameron, you're forgiven. And you can say, oh, I wonder what Cameron did to him. You know, but that's between us, isn't it? But if I say, all you people over there, you're all forgiven. Well, what have you ever done to me? Except be slow to answer the questions. <laughs> you know? Well, you haven't done anything to me. Who do I think I am that can say, all your sins are forgiven. You see, only God can forgive sins like that. Or again, notice the surprise that he eats with sinners. He's supposed to be the holy man of God and he hangs around with a low life. And he doesn't fast. All religious people fast. But he feasts because he sees himself as a bridegroom. In our, in our weddings, we all wait for the bride. But in the Jewish weddings, they waited for the bridegroom. But when the bride comes, you feast. But until the bride comes, you just hang out waiting for the food, don't you? And other things, the photos, uh, and her. But you, you, it's, it's, there's no wedding until the, until the bride comes. There's no wedding until the bridegroom comes. And when the bridegroom's there, it's feast time. It's happy time. Who fasts, who mourns at a wedding? A wedding is full of fun and pleasure and enjoyment. And Jesus says, as long as you've got me, the feasting is on. That's why I don't tell my disciples how to fast. Mind you, he does say something about being taken away, but more of that in a moment. He then says in verse 28, you see, they're all caught under the law about rules and regulations. They want to say it's, it's against the law to to just pick up some, some grain on the way. And Jesus says, no, the law was made for man, not man for the law. And indeed, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. This is an extraordinary thing to be saying. And then in chapter 3, he looks at anger because they won't, they won't allow a man to be healed on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is for doing good, not for doing bad. But you say, oh, you mustn't heal him on the Sabbath because that's work. Let him continue with a withered arm. Let him continue with a destroyed body. But don't heal him on the Sabbath. 
Jesus, because he was surprising, he was always, as Cameron told us at the beginning, controversial. Who can forgive sins but God alone, they ask? Oh, why is he eating with sinners and tax collectors? What kind of religious man does that? Or chapter 2, verse 18. How, how come he doesn't fast like everybody else, even John the Baptist? Now, John the Baptist is a friend, not an enemy like the Pharisees, but even John the Baptist fasts. So how come? And, and it's not lawful to go picking up things. And Notice at the end of where I finished reading, chapter 3, verse 6. The Herodians met with the Pharisees and plotted to kill him, to destroy him. That, 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 that's like saying, you know, the Greens met with the, the, the Nationals to agree about they don't like him. No, it's not Liberal Labor. It's out there on the fringe. The Herodians hated the Pharisees. The Pharisees hated the Herodians, but they both hated Jesus more. Because he undermined everything for everybody. He also has this controversial title he keeps talking about, the Son of Man. It's mentioned 14 times in Mark's Gospel. Jesus is the only person who uses it, and he always uses it about himself. No one else calls Jesus Son of Man, and he doesn't call himself anything else but Son of Man. Now, that becomes, therefore, a technical term. So let me just take a couple of moments with it. The first time it's used is in chapter 2, verse 10, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And the second time is in chapter 2, verse 28, that the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. The phrase Son of Man was, was an Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic, as best we know, an Aramaic phrase. Aramaic's a cross somewhere between Hebrew and Arab, Arabic. But he spoke this, this form, Galilean form of speech. Son of man was a phrase that had three different meanings. Firstly, it meant human. You know, son of man, get on your feet, says God to, to Ezekiel. just means human. Secondly, it can mean oneself. It's, it, when you talk about yourself as if you're somebody else, uh, one can have one's Korg is looked after in one's palace if one wants to, but one generally does not. Right? You know she's talking about herself, but you also know it's a bit weird. But then if you live with, in a palace with corgis, you are slightly unusual. I won't say weird, that would be disrespectful to our gracious sovereign lady. So when Jesus talks about oneself, you know he's talking about himself, but it's, it's odd. There's a third reason me. In Daniel chapter 7, the judgment of the world takes place. And at a critical moment in the judgment of the world, just as God is about to judge everybody, a man, a son of man, comes to God and God gives him all power and authority to rule over all nations and all peoples for all time. You don't know his name, you don't know anything about him, he comes, just, he just arrives, the Son of Man who's going to rule the universe in the judgment day. Jesus calls himself Son of Man. He's emphasising he's human. He's talking about himself. But he actually means he's the fulfilment of Daniel 7. That's why the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. That's why the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath, the end of the world age, you see. But they don't understand that. They don't hear that because they think he's just talking about himself. Or is he? And so he's posing this question by this phrase, Son of Man. But he also likens himself to being the bridegroom because <laughs> he's the one who brings the feasting of the great day, the great age, the great celebration you see when 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 god's judgment comes heaven comes and heaven's a feast time my grandsons will be there that's for sure it's full of food it's full of joy my granddaughters will be there cuddling too and the idea is the same we have here you see a new age is coming you, you, it's, it's it's a completely different age you can't put old wine in new wine skins and it's just not the same. Something fundamentally is changing with the coming of Jesus. The Pharisees imprison people in their laws. 
even John, because of the fasting over the sinfulness of the nation and calling upon people to repent, didn't come to the release. But Jesus comes bringing forgiveness and acceptance and party time of salvation. Jesus is bringing in the Sabbath, the end of the world, the rest time for the holidays when the diseased and the sinners and the outcast and the traitors will all be forgiven and, and a fresh start happens, a clean slate is given. And so the judgment at the end of the world will be a time of great mercy. And, but it comes from the repentant. With Jesus present, it's party time. But in verse 20, he's going to be taken away for the cross. And that will be sad time. But not ultimately the sad time because he's going to rise from the dead. He's not saying it here, but we know that now, don't we? And with the resurrection, it's the feast time. And so while we're in this world, we have a sense of fasting because it's such a sinful, wretched world. And, you know, what's going to happen with the... Is there going to be war with the Russians? And is there going to be... And we've got the sicknesses here and we've got the corruption there. And, you know, there's so much to complain about in this world if you want to. But if you live with Jesus... You're also a part of the Sabbath world, the next world, the world to come. This is the happy time. This is the feast time. This is the day of the Lord. Let's rejoice and be glad in it, you see, because we're in this day. And so in Australia today, we still have moralists, people who make up rules for others and imprison others in their failures. I mean, it can be the religious ones who, with rules and regulations about church going and about clothes that you wear and about fast days and, and what you can eat and what you can't eat and the like. But it's, it's wider than that. Moralists today are about sexism and racism and environmentalism and veganism and, and there's no joy in a moralist's life. If you notice, no matter what happens, they can find something else to complain about, something else to warn you about disasters happening. If all the moralists are to be believed, the world has been going downhill since 1066 and the battle of that. I mean, it's always going downhill. There's always, oh, this is not right, though. There's sad sacks if ever you met them. Constant criticism and disappointment in a world going wrong. And so they censor people. They shame people. They attack people in the social media. And in the end, they cancel them. You're not allowed to even be here. You've got no platform. You can't speak. But Christianity is not about being moral. Christianity is about being forgiven. Christians aren't good people. Christians are forgiven people. Hey, if Christians are good people, I'm not one. But if Christians are forgiven people, I am one. <laughs> but the thing you've got to do to be forgiven is sin. Well, I've done that, and so have you. So don't look at me like that. You've all done that, haven't you? We've made our contribution to forgiveness. And God has made his contribution to forgiveness by sending his son to die for us. And so forgiveness is what we're about, a clean sight. And that's what makes Jesus such a controversial king in his day and continues to be one in our day because it doesn't fit people's expectations. The world outside thinks that we're here having moral lessons about the rules and regulations of what you're to do and what you're not to do and what you... No, we're here for party time. That's what we're here for, enjoying life with our brothers and sisters in the family of God, singing his praises and enjoying each other's company. That's what we're here Feasting next week, they cancelled it this week. And they're feasting next week, right? That's the character of it. But of course, you've got to be part of Christ's party. You've got to have Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. For it's only by his death and resurrection that we know our past is forgiven and our future is assured. That knowing our past is forgiven, knowing our future is assured, we can face God. Not afraid of God, not terrified of God. God's not an ogre that to avoid. God is my loving Father who wants me to enjoy the life that he has given me. He wants you, he wants us to enjoy the life that he's given to us. 
He wants, and we can face our brothers and sisters with honesty and truth. Friends, I'm not really good. I have done bad things. And I know you have. And we don't have to pretend to each other. It changes the game. And I can face the mirror and see the grey hair and say, isn't that good? I don't have to pull it out. I don't have to pretend to be something that I am not. I can rejoice in the good things God has governed. Do you remember the parable of Jesus of the prodigal son? You know how the son who took the money and went away and then spent it all on wild living and then when he's down, he's at the bottom of the pig's pit, he suddenly comes to his own right mind and says, life in my father's house for the servants is better than life out here in this world. So he goes home and repents. Remember how his father welcomes him? Rejoicing, my son who is lost has been found. My son who is dead is alive. Every parent knows that feeling. You don't want your kids to go off the rails, but boy, any kid who did go off the rails and comes back like that, the joy would be just overwhelming, wouldn't it? When the sinner comes back to God through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, heaven is filled with joy. The angels rejoice. And the father rejoiced, and what did he do? Put on a party. That's what he did, because his dead son had come back. Do you remember the old brother? The moralist? Gee, I've been here all the time. I've been working really hard. You never give me a party. I just got to go out and look after the things. I suppose you want me to actually cook the barbecue for these people. <laughs> you know? The moralist never has the joy. Because the moralist never feels the father's joy. What about you? <laughs> Do you know the joy of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour? Do you know the joy of sins forgiven? The joy of being able to face the truth and to know God is your Father and to rejoice in the pleasures that come from being in the Sabbath day. If you don't, then make sure you talk to someone. Talk to Cameron about it. I'll be around for a little while afterwards. Come and talk to me about it. Because we would want you to enjoy the party. We don't want anybody left outside the party. We want you in the party to enjoy it with us. As the old saying goes, the more, the merrier. So come and join us in the great party of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he came to release us and to rescue us from the condemnations of this world from the failings of this world, from the rules and regulations of religion and philosophy and moralists, that he came to give us new life, free from our sinfulness, paid for fully by him, and brought to new life by his spirit through his risen resurrection. Help us, each one, Father, to rejoice in our life that you've given us, not to be persuaded into that kind of negativity again. And pray, Father, for those of us who do not yet know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, that as we come week by week hearing about him, we may change our mind and understanding of him and see him as the one you sent to save us. And we may turn back to you through him and find the forgiveness that he's won for us. We pray for each other, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, isn't it great that we have a Heavenly Father who has dealt with our sins and we can have a future that is secured in him. There's nothing but the blood of Jesus. So please stand with us and sing. Deep
My name is John. Uh, please join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for giving us each other, this people, this church. We thank you for your word that galvanizes us together and gives us everything necessary for teaching, rebuking, and training in righteousness. We thank you this morning for Philip Jensen and for the humor, wisdom, and clarity he's brought to us through your word, learned through his life of service to you. We thank you too for the long legacy of the Billy Graham Crusades in this diocese, the Anglican Church, and this nation as a whole. 
we pray for new Billy Grahams and a new generation of gospel leaders in Australia. Lord, we're mindful of our leaders. We thank you for our ministry team. We pray for Luther and Lenore on leave, Andy and Miriam as they deal with sickness and begin their new work at Botany Anglican very soon. And of course, for Cam and Rachel, for Amelia, for Lockie and our interns and curates. Bless them with the peace, restoration and wisdom that comes from knowing you and you'll pour your blessings on them as they lead us and our children. In mind of our leaders, Father, we pray and thank you for our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, thanking you for the 70 years of service she has bought and the stability she has shared with a Christ-like heart of service to her people. We pray for our government in this country, federal, state and local, and ask that they would look to you and to Christ, our true and controversial King, as they look to serve us. Lastly, Father, as our news feeds and TVs are filled with wars, disease and famine, and rumours of wars, disease and famine, we pray for your people, the church. We pray that our pastors, bishops, priests, clergy, our brothers and sisters, grant them all and us a sense of peace and godliness in turbulent times. We particularly lift up the church in persecuted countries, in places like China and North Korea and the Middle East. We pray for the ministries and organisations that seek to support and enhance the gospel in those countries and grant us here, in our privileged lives in Australia, a spirit of generosity, prayer and devotion to love and support them. We pray all of these things through Jesus' mighty and controversial name, Lord. Amen. Thanks, John. Yeah, just that over there. Thank you. Hey, well, friends, as I mentioned earlier on, next week... Well, you know, Jesus, he, he brings the party, he's the life of the party, but we're going to continue our party here next week as well with our own church lunch as we also farewell um, the Booters. They'll be able to, God willing, join us uh, on, on that day too. So come ready for that, come ready to stick around, and that'll be a great time for us. We'll get the Jumping Castle and uh, be praying as well that that playground will be open. I know it's a sitting there teasing you and your kids, but... Keep that in your prayers too. But uh, what else is coming up is I've been over the last few weeks telling you about the, uh, the NCLS, the National Church Life Survey. And you may have noticed there at the bottom of that slide, it says to be completed online at your convenience sometime over the next three weeks. Now, that was the message at the start of February. You know what? Those three weeks have come up now. So can I encourage you this coming week, set aside just 15 minutes to complete the National Church Life Survey, that would really help us as a church to be planning and praying and as we consider who we are together and within the community that we are going forward. So whether you have been with us for a long time or you are uh, relatively new here, we'd love for your input with the NCLS survey. And the way to do that, it'll be again in, your, in the e-news, it'll be in our Hope Church group, it'll be in a text message coming out. So whichever way that you get it, Give uh, a moment for you and also any of your sort of teenage children from year six up, our youth age up, uh, is a, it's a survey for you all to, uh, to have a go at. So please uh, give some time to that this coming week. Uh, next week, of course, I'll, I'll mention this as well, uh, is that thank God that restrictions continue to, to ease. Uh, praise Him for that provision. And so uh, masks and next week won't be mandatory in church though. If you'd still like to wear it, that's a good idea too. But that is something that we can uh, continue to, uh, to praise Him for in that growing confidence in our community. Uh, one last thing is on your way in, you received hopefully one of these uh, handouts that we looked at earlier. Included in that is our Connect With Us form. This is a great way for you just to let us know how have you been encouraged today? Or maybe how did you come along to hear about hope? Who did you come along with? Do you have a question? Something that struck you from our passage today, something that struck you about this controversial king. Uh, if you're joining us for one of the first times, we'd especially love to hear you and hear from you so that we can help welcome you here at Hope Church. Uh, so let me give you a moment or two now as I fill this out myself, and then I'll bring us back together in just a bit. You, my God, have saved my soul.
We're going to have some boxes coming around during our final song. Those boxes, they are just for those connect slips. So pop those in, pass it along the road. Uh, row. That will be uh, fantastic. But as we come, to, we, we, we declare now in this final song another wonderful but oh so controversial truth that there is no other name through which we can be saved. But that is the good news of the gospel. So let's sing it loudly.
as you remain standing, friends. Our time is coming to a close here, but it continues. So join us for morning tea and coffee and tea uh, just around the corner as well. A few uh, dropped off your kids. Uh, collect those and bring them back down as we continue our, our time together. But will you join with me in prayer as we finish here now? Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, the Lord, Messiah, Son of Man, the Bridegroom, the one who has come to show us and to bring us joy because there is life in him. Father, help us to see what is truly at the heart of the gospel, of truly at the heart of you. You desire us to know you. You desire people to be saved from the sin. So, Lord, help us to turn from our sin. Help us to turn from our moralism. Help us to see the freedom that lies in Christ, our King. And we pray this in his mighty name. Amen. Great to have you this morning here at Hope. See you next week.